Okay, well, thank you very much for staying so long. Can you guys hear me at the end of the room? Give me a thumbs up. Fantastic. So welcome to this session. It's called The Joy of Agile Work. And somehow by accident or by serendipity, there seems to be a thread starting with this morning's presentation um, to this you know, book, book handing one at the end of the day. Okay, so my name is Sanjeev Augustine. I want to share a couple of words of introduction to myself. Uh, I started my career, the year ticker went one year, so she said 25 and 15. If you look on the slide, it says 26 and 16. This one is actually right because it is now 2016. And uh, I started my career a long time ago um, as, an, uh, as a production assistant for an advertising company. From there, I became an engineer to a developer to a project manager to uh, management consultant uh, and then now agile consultant and coach and entrepreneur. Uh, there's a story I'd like to tell in the introduction to myself, and this was my first experience with Agile. Now, there's, I'm sure there are people over here who have heard or have participated or been part of the XP, Extreme Programming Movement. So let's see a, sh a show of hands over here. Who knows of or has, or has practiced Extreme Programming or XP in the past? There you go. So look around you, and you'll see something that has um, either predated or coexisted with Scrum, the Agile, you know, prevalent Agile method for about 15 or 16 years ago. So 16 years ago, I was hired as a manager, and my boss at that time, this was in a Washington DC consulting company, my boss at that time said, we have these three XP teams, and they're doing good stuff, they're de delivering code, quality code, but I think they could, lead a, they could use a little guidance to be a little more customer alignment, and we have to figure out how this management stuff that we do fi fits into XP or Agile. So I said, okay, fantastic, let's find out about that. And um, I was new to the company, so I asked my boss, how do I learn about XP? So he said, go out and buy this book uh, called XP Explained. And I think uh, I saw that on the first speaker's um, slide, uh, slide deck over there. Um, the book itself is very beautiful read. It's a classic, you should go back and read it sometime. I went through the book, it was about 120 pages or so, and having come from a background of software development myself, I thought, oh, this all makes sense. This is great software engineering discipline. discipline. Um, however, there's a nagging feeling that I had when I got to the end of the book. I said, um, it occurred to me that I'd not seen a lot about the role of the manager. So I went back to the index and looked for something about the role of a manager on, on an XP, or an XP, uh, extreme programming team. And there was one paragraph in, the, in that entire book, and I don't remember the entire paragraph, but there's one line that I'll never forget. It said, the role of a manager on an XP, or an Agile team, is to remove impediments for a team and to bring the team pizza. So I thought, okay, this is not a bad place to start. I think I can do that. But what we've learned over the years is that it's a lot more than just removing impediments for the team or bringing the team pizza. If you look at the larger project management context or larger product management constraints, then you bring in things like a planning game, or release planning, or scaling to programs and portfolios. And more recently, we've discovered a lot about what we call performance management or agile performance management. So we're gonna be talking about that. Um, it turns out that even though when we on agile teams can be having a lot of fun, put your hands up if you're having fun on an agile team. All right, so look around you and you say, well, you know, we're having fun on an agile team. This is why we gave up Waterfall. I hear regularly, you know, I'll never go back to Waterfall because I, once I move to Agile, whether it's Scrum or Kanban or XP, we can actually deliver value to our customers. We can have fun doing it, and we can feel fulfilled doing that as well. But if you look a little, a little bit outside of our team rooms or our cubicles, we can start to see that the larger organizations in which we exist are not exactly the happiest places or the most joyful places to work. So we look at an industry snapshot, and what I want to do today is to talk a little bit about the overall industry context and introduce the notion of an agile performance management system. And two major pieces over there. One is a process, a general process, a lightweight process to follow that can help us re replace the 360, you know, the annual appraisal process. And then something that we sort of loosely call right now people operations, which we want to be able to orient and replace or transition us from what we used to call performance management. Right? So transition perf uh, performance management to people operations, and loosely we want to base that around autonomy, mastery, and purpose, 
I also have on your uh, tables a single sheet of paper that has an APMS design exercise. We'll get your feedback at the end and have you guys do that. So if you want to reach out and make sure you get a copy of that, that'll be great. All right, so another poll for you. Um, what I'd like to do is to get a sense of agile experience in the room. If you're new to Agile, let's say you've been doing it for six months or less, you've been six months or less of experience with Agile methods, we'll count that as a newbie. Let's call that a newbie or a level one. If, you're, if you have six to 18 months of experience, then that's an intermediate level, let's call that uh, a level two. So newbie, six months or less, intermediate, six to 18 months. And then if you have 18 months or more, and many of speakers and many of you have uh, been around for a while, 18 months or more, level three experts. Let's see, show of hands, put your hands up if you're level one. Level one, just a few people. Level two, lots of level twos, and level threes, all right. Lots of level threes, wow, awesome. So I can go, I can skip a lot of the basics then. Um, so you guys, most of you know then that uh, we are now at an inflection point in the Agile in space, right? We've gone from team-based Agile with Scrum, Kanban, some of the team-based methodologies, and now we're looking at newer scaling methods like the Scaled Agile Framework, Disciplined Agile Delivery, Last, Nexus, and Scrum and Scale and such. But we also st still see that Scrum seems to be the bedrock on which we're building all of these things. Okay, we're having fun on our Agile teams. We're looking outside and our organizations seem to be in a bit of a mess, right? How do we know this? Well, we can, we can talk to our colleagues, we can look at our own experience, or we can look at industry surveys that tell us something like this. Only, this is from a Gallup, a Gallup poll and also from Glassdoor. These are US numbers. Uh, I saw another speaker, Fabiola, is she here? So she, she had numbers on India, which are very close. Um, only 13% of employees are highly engaged in what they're doing at work. Right? Very somber sort of thing uh, if you look at these numbers. 26% are actively disengaged. Now, I want to ask you guys, what does it mean to be highly engaged? I'm sorry? I couldn't hear. S yell it out, you know, don't worry. This is, so I'm, this is gonna be conversational. You ask for somebody for a mic. Yeah. Think beyond the brief, complete ownership of what? Of whatever we're doing, right? So can we show up to work? Can we take ownership of what we're, of what we're doing? What else is being highly engaged? Understanding what we're doing and why we're doing. If we understand what we're doing and why we're doing it, then we're more likely to be engaged, involved, more productive and such. All right, and if you're not engaged, it turns out that we're not happy. But we're not happy, we're disillusioned, we have complaints and disillusionment and uh, uh, hopefully not depression, but maybe this will be sort of become clinical at, well, at some point as well. So we want to sort of avoid this, right? And um, now, who do you think is not happy? Who, are the, who do you think they're talking about? Are they talking about employees or managers or both? Put your hands up if, they're talking about if you think they're talking about employees. Who thinks they're talking about employees? Who thinks they're talking about managers? Who doesn't understand the question? All right, when we say that people are not happy, are they talking about employees not being happy, managers not being happy, or both? Employees or managers? Even. So it's, it's both, right? So we have an antiquated performance management system that leaves all of us unhappy. Put your hands up if you're a manager. Are you a manager? Well, lots of managers. We're all unhappy, I'm a manager myself. And because I was unhappy, I, I had to look for something different, right? So we know Agile makes our teams happy, and when our teams are happy and when our customers are happy, then we're happy. So what we want to do is to look beyond this command and control system that leaves all of us unhappy, divides us into two opposing factions and leaves us all unhappy, all right? In particular, we want to look at this, this uh, dreaded instrument that we call the performance manager, uh, the annual review. So who here, is, did I, I, I think I heard earlier that this, it's appraisal time. Is it appraisal time right now? Put your hands up if you're going through appraisals now. Keep your hands up if you're really happy about going through appraisals. <laughs> All right, so tell me why you're not happy about appraisals. What's that? 
It's a selective process. I don't like to be selective, so I'll be put down, somebody else will be put up. Other reasons why you're not happy with appraisals. Lagging indicators, yeah, so it's, things have moved on, and why is that? How often do you do appraisals? Annual, right? Who does appraisals once a year? Put your hands up if you do appraisals once a year. Put your hands up if you do appraisals more than once a year, maybe you know, quarterly or bi, you know, bi-yearly. Okay, so most uh, unbelievably, you know, even today, it turns out that uh, annual ratings are still common, still the norm. And even though the trend is away from that, we're still have to we still have to fight this, uh, this particular instrument. Uh, look at what e Edwards Deming is saying. Edwards Deming, of course, the guy who came up with lean and then went on to create what's called total quality management. Look at the powerful words he's using, not complimentary at, well, at, at all. You know? um, annual ratings are a disease. They leave people desolate and despondent, despondent, really unhappy. So our question is, what can we do about this annual review? Let's sort of unpack it. What is the problem with the annual review? Uh, there's, there are studies that show that one of the core problems with the annual review is that it combines or bundles three management functions into one instrument, right? One of the functions is feedback. Everybody needs feedback to improve. If you're doing well, we want to hear that we're doing well and improve on that, amplify that success. If you're not doing well, we want to be able to hear that as well so that we get constructive criticism so that we can improve and get better. And we as human beings need that feedback regularly. Compensation and merit pay. We all want to get paid. If there's any merit pay to be done, that gets bundled together with the feedback that's supposed to given, be given with our appraisal process. And then if you're not doing well, and if our employees, uh, employers want to terminate our employment, then we end up having the, the uh, annual performance review becomes a legal instru instrument, at least in the USA, where we tend to be a quite uh, litigious type of society to get legal cover, all right? So um, this is Bangalore, so who likes uh, Bisi Belebat? Just a few, who knows what Bisi Belebat is? Okay, if you don't know, you should probably ask. In fact, I think they had it on the, uh, on the uh, buffet as well. And the problem is that we have a Bisi Belebat of an annual performance review. And we need to separate it, separate these three things, and make them more of a thali. Who likes a thali? Right? You can combine them, as they, but at least if they're separate, then we have feedback, compensation, uh, and merit pay, and legal cover. We can start, separate these things. So can we make people's lives happier and also make money at the same time? So it's not just that we should all be happy and then our company should be going down in, into, uh, you know, into liquidation. right? So we should be happy and we should be productive and successful at the same time. So that's our uh, topic today. Let's sort of sh shift gears and to introduce how we should go about separating those two, three things that we just talked about. I want to call on John Carter. John Carter, of course, the renowned change management guru from Harvard Business School. And here he is talking about the 21st century organization. So let's pull up John Carter. Hello, I'm John Cotter, and I'm here to talk to you about winning in a faster and faster moving world where more threats are coming at us from all kinds of different unpredictable directions, but also in which there are more windows of opportunity opening and closing faster than ever. I am convinced that we've crossed a line in which the old methods that we've used to deal with this no longer work. And I want to talk to you briefly about what seems to work in this faster and faster moving world. To understand this, I found you need to understand how organizations naturally evolve over time and how that has gotten us to where we are now. All organizations start with a, a structure that kind of looks like a dynamic uh, solar system or a molecule. Their advantage of is that they can be very, very fast, uh, very agile. They can run around existing competition. They start with a um, set of entrepreneurs. It doesn't matter if they're trying to make a new type of microchip or a new type of chocolate chip cookie. They attract people who work on various initiatives. It could be anything. Uh, playing around with crazy ideas, talking to customers, uh, doing things with alloys, 
Um, and they can drop those initiatives and start new ones. If they're successful, though, they have to be able to make and ship a product or deliver a service. And as soon as that happens, you start to see growing something that we would recognize. It looks more like a hierarchy. It has jobs. It has processes. And if they continue to be successful, of course, it's that part that has to grow. And it grows. And for a brief time, you've got both both systems that tend to be hooked together well uh, because of the entrepreneurs who play a part in both uh, and sometimes the old timers that have jobs over at one side and they're still in that entrepreneurial system. But as successful as they are, you know what part grows and it grows and at a certain point it doesn't like the old entrepreneurial, unpredictable, whipping around system, and so it systematically eliminates it. And you end up with what we all know, a typical modern organization. Now, in a slow enough moving world, uh, that can work fine, and it does. But as the world starts to speed up, it doesn't. And so what smart people do is they augment it. They add uh, strategic planning committees. They hire strategic consultants. They put together interdepartmental task forces or project management organizations to first create and then to execute strategies. And if this is done well, it works up to a point. But as the world speeds up more and more, it doesn't. So they continue along this same path. It happens naturally. You add another committee. You add work streams. You add more strategy pieces. And after a while, all of this addition, addition, addition actually slows you down, and the whole thing starts to sink into the muck, which obviously does not win today. It raises the question of what could win today and actually, you just saw it a minute ago. Now, let's rewind the tape. Okay, start there and go back. Go back some more. Now stop. There it is. Something that can be reliable and efficient now and can be fast and agile in helping you maneuver through this faster moving environment. It creates more wealth, better products and services, a terrific place to work, and perhaps mo most importantly, profitable growth. Okay, so our job now is if we work with an organization that has become bureaucratic, if we work with an organization that has become slower and less responsive to change, how can we retain those elements of the organization that are, have made us fast and efficient, but also now, I'm sorry, reliable and efficient, but now also work towards creating a structure or peeling back some of the structure that we have that will allow us to be fast and agile as, as well. So to do that, if we look at motivation, and th there's some great work out there by Dan Pink, Daniel Pink, I think most of you will know who Dan Pink is. Put your hands up if you've seen the Dan Pink video, or read the Dan Pink dri book drive. Yeah, so mo um, most of you know this uh, work. You can go to danpink.com or just go to Google, I'm sorry, YouTube, and he's got a video on motivation, Daniel Pink, and check it out. And what he's shown is that extrins extrinsic rewards, rewards outside of ourselves, that is either money, you know, carrot type rewards, or punishment, like being fired or something, are not long-term motivators. The thing that keep us motivated, the things that keep us motivated over the longer term are intrinsic, internal to ourselves. And the three things that he identifies as intrinsic motivators are autonomy, mastery, and purpose. So if we are to design an agile performance management system, what we want to do is to tap into those three intrinsic motivators because that's what will allow us to create an, an, an organization that is both fast and agile and reliable and efficient. 
So the first thing that we want to do is to say, we have this traditional performance review. How can I dismantle that and now put in a lighter process? The process that we recommend you put in is something called a personal A3. The A3, of course, comes from the size of the paper. It's a lean, lean Six Sigma process or artifact where you put all of the problem solving and solution items on this one paper. And what we like to do is to put a lightweight performance plan, if you will, or you know, a, um, uh, an artifact together that captures the goals for a person and a way to achieve those goals over a particular time. So if you look at this, this particular uh, slide, it's showing you in a tool, the tool is called LeanKit, and we are, this is quite active, you can ma manage this, drag and drop this, and it's showing you three sections. The top section is activity, the, section, the middle section are skills, and then there's a Kaizen, which is improvement, Kanban. If you look at the you know, left-hand side, it has to do with current, and the right-hand side has to do with future. So what, what ends up happening is that an, an employee can sit down with his or her mentor and lay out all of the current activities that they're working on. And they can also say, well, I, I do want to be involved in some future uh, activities like coaching or account management, and the exercise of sitting down and doing this collaboratively with the mentor ensures that there's an alignment between the, the needs and desires and the wants of the individual with the needs and objectives and overall goals of the company itself. Likewise, we look at the current skills, what an employee has, and what they want to do in the future. And then we say, well, how do we go from where we are today to where we want to be in the future? Mentor and mentee together, they're going to sit down and come up with a plan, and the plan is very lightweight, you know, do this, you know, put, in, put in place some action items, and over the space of six months, maybe over the space of a year, there's a plan to move forward with this career development. Now, this, the process part of this is that there's a monthly meeting with, between employee and employer, um, a management mentor or just a coach, where they'll sit down and say, how are you doing? Can we take a quick, can we take a quick set of feedback, you know, how, you know, how what's working, what's not working, is there any help you need from me as a mentor, and they can sit down with their employee and progress that forward. So not only do we have a lightweight structure, but there's a process that goes along with that, right? So that's the lightweight process. Now, this is just one side of what needs to happen. This is, you know, we, we shouldn't look at the tool and see that this is the be all and end all of our goal. The other thing that we need to start to do is to look at changing the overall culture. And to change the overall culture to make it more self-managing, more transparent, and more fast and agile, more sweeping changes have to be put in place. And these usually have to come from the top and channeled by way of our friends in HR, right? Human resources, right? So these are the things that we call people operations. Now I'm gonna give you some examples that have to do with changing performance management into people operations and giving bigger or larger autonomy to the people on, on the ground. And specifically, we're gonna talk about open workspace, flexible work hours, open vacation, fair rewards, and slack time. Who has a workspace that looks like this? Every Agile team is supposed to look like this. So look around you and this, if only, is it, uh, let's see those, that show of hands again. Open workspace. If, if we're truly doing Agile, then I would expect to see, I would want to see the reverse of what I see right now. The majority of hands should go up. What are, what are the advantages of an open workspace? Why do you think we're calling for an open workspace? Somebody's gotta write the, bo the book. You guys all said you knew Agile. Better communication. I'm sorry? To have open, uh, open discussions, better communication, when we co-locate people like this, productivity can go up by up to 400%. Right? There's some IEEE studies that show you that, you know, that when we co-locate people, have them in an open workspace, team productivity can go, uh, there are some negative effects, I will talk about that, but team productivity can go up, and there's a phenomenon known as osmotic communication, where people can, you know, there's communication by osmosis, I absorb it, whether I'm listening to it or not, I pick it up, and that's the advantage of an op open workspace. The other thing that we can have is a le higher level of transparency and coming. Yes, sir, you had some, uh, some. Yeah. Right. Okay, 
so yeah, build the right thing, do, make the decisions fast. Yeah, I would, I would also, I would uh, add them all to be making sure that we're all delivering the right solution. So well said. Okay, open work says, if you don't have it, we should put it in place, right? Um, when we do that, we have to make sure that we preserve some, you know, caves for privacy. Make sure that people have privacy, that you can go off and do, you know, phone calls, emails, maybe some creative work. And the common area, the open workspace is great for all of the things that we, we talked about, but you also want to balance it with some private space. Now, if you, since you don't, most, when most of you don't have an open workspace, I'm not going to ask you how many of you do have caves, but if you do, you shouldn't have just open workspace, you should also preserve some space where people can go off and do private stuff, because that's where the creative, some of the creative individual problem solving comes in. If you're doing individual development or testing or analysis, we need to make sure that we have some caves for individual privacy and commons or the open workspace for uh, team collaboration, all right? Next thing, flexible work hours. Who, who among uh, over here can choose when you work, you know, with some constraints as far as uh, work things out with your managers, work things out with your customers, uh, but you can choose when you work and from where? So your name, sir? Vishal can choose your work hours. And how, uh, how does it work for you? Works really great. Why does it work really good? So, and, and your customers don't care, or they, that kind of stuff. How, no, I, I guess my question is, how do you work yeah. it out with your boss or your, with your customer? Does your whole company work that way? And your company's name is? Agile? Agile FAQs. Agile FAQs. Okay, this is a narration company. Of course, we yes. won't ask it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you shouldn't have raised your hand. Let's take it. Yeah. What's that? You work remotely. So remote workers, how many of you guys work remotely? So this should be a fair thing. So can we have flexible work hours? Uh, anybody else with flexible work hours? Okay, yes, sir. And that's quite reasonable. You have core hours, you, you meet in the office, but after that, your time is your own and you do, it, you do your work and your problem. If you're professional adults, then as long as we meet our team commitments, can we be trusted Maybe we're not of surfing, instead of real surfing, we'll be web surfing and doing stuff, but we should be able to choose our own work hours, right? Flexible work hours might not seem that radical um, once we look at it from a business perspective. Open vacation, this one's pretty radical, at least in the US it is. Uh, who has open vacation? Anybody? No, don't agile FAQs. Uh. <laughs> Dan, you have open vacation? That's right. You can take as much vacation as you like, and as long as you don't get fired. Yeah. So there's that caveat over there. <laughs> yeah. This is not unlimited vacation that I you know decided to go like a, on a one-year pilgrimage to the Himalayas and don't come back. Right. That's not the. <laughs> that's not what we're talking about. It's can I use my personal time, my vacation time, my my sick leave, uh, in an intelligent way so that you know it'll fit me and the company that I work for and the team that I'm working with, right? Now, n no less than Richard Branson of Virgin has turned this around and said, everybody can take you know, vacation when they can. And it's, it's starting to be less radical than when it sounds. In fact, it turns out, well, let me ask you a question. If you give people this option, do you think they take more vacation time or less vacation time? They actually end up taking less vacation time. So this is kind of maybe almost uh, subtle and evil from a management perspective. You say, oh yeah, you can take open vacation and people take less vacation. Well, they take about the same, maybe slightly, uh, slightly less, but do you think they're happier, more happy or less happy because they have open vacation? And why are they more happy? Because you have control, right? It's all about, can I be trusted to have control over my vacation time, my work hours, and if I do, then that's gonna result in me being happier and more engaged. LinkedIn, by the way, has, some, has open vacation. They've gone, and more and more companies are moving in this direction. All right, let's talk about compensation. Fair base salary. If we are paying people, we have to be cognizant of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and we have to make sure that we're paying good people a good base salary, otherwise they're going to all end up working for agile FAQs uh, and leave us. Mm. And so fair base salary, whatever the market rate is, has to be paid. Next step is what about merit pay? Um, Deming would say, and we believe, and, and subscribe to this belief as well, that any profit sharing rewards should be granted only by the team, not by the individual. Now this might be 
uh, somewhat unpopular and uh, uh, radical to say, but you're going to see more and more companies that will pay a fair base pay and then all financial rewards given to teams. Why do, think we, why do we think we align things this way? Well, on Agile teams, we say our teams need to work together. You have to collaborate. You have to work with the customers. But then our performance management and our incentives are aligned to split us apart, to give us individual compensation. So this might be somewhat radical, but it's definitely the direction in which in companies that are looking at putting in agile performance management are moving. Give out performance, profit sharing, compensation, you know, uh, any sort of thing over and above base salary given only to the team. And then the team decides sometimes either you give everybody on the team gets an equal share or depending on the maturity of the organization, um, you can talk to Raj. Where's Raj? Raj? Raj is way at the back. Give Raj a big hand. Since he's there. Can you see a hand again? Raj, can you stand up, please? Yeah. Raj will tell you how, to, how profit sharing works uh, at our company where we have every quarter the team members get together and they decide how much each person gets. Right? And there are companies where that's happening as well. So that happens at light speed, and Raj can give you the details. He's closer to it than I am. All right, that's merit pay. Slack time. We hire smart people. Who wants to hire not so smart people? Yeah. We all say, we, who wants to hire smart people? Put your hands up. There are a lot of man managers, just a few, okay? All right, so it, I saw half the room, uh, uh, half the hands in the room go up when you said we are managers, and we're all managers, we want to hire smart people, and then we put them to work doing dumb work, right? Useless operational stuff that's not really making good use of the time, overloading them. It turns out that if you reserve some slack time in their work schedules, that's the time we, they, our smart people can actually be smart. They can innovate, they can problem solve, they can help us deal with the wick, wicked problems. If we don't have that slack time, you find people migrating or falling towards the repetitive work, you know, checking emails, sending nasty emails, that kind of stuff, checking status, doing things that are just basically uh, keep running the engine and not getting us towards the more creative problem solving. So Atlassian, Google, you have this concept of a 20% time. Who's heard of 20% time? Right, so 20% time, I'm gonna play a short clip from this lady at Atlassian. She's a QA lead at uh, Atlassian, and she's talking about how it works at their company. Hi, um, Penny, you're here at the um, Better Software Agile Development Conferences uh, conference, and you're with Atlassian. So tell us a little bit about yourself, if you don't mind. Okay, I'm the QA team lead for the JIRA team at Atlassian. I lead a team of five QA engineers. Uh -huh. And so I accosted you um, to ask you to speak about the 20% time at uh, Atlassian because we've heard a lot about that. Could you um, just give us an idea of how you actually implement that on your um, on your uh, JIRA team at uh, Atlassian? So on the JIRA team, we have this group called the incubator team. And basically our mandate is to make sure that 20% actually happens and that 20% projects do actually ship to customers. Because we used to have a problem that people would go off, they'd spend their 20% time, and they'd never really get their projects completed. So what we do on the incubator team is we look at people's projects before they start. Mm -hmm. um, we give them an idea up front about whether it's something that we are going to want to have in the product in the end. And we give them an idea of what kind of testing and what quality bar we expect from them. Okay. So, the, so if I get you, uh, if I understand you right, so the um, team members will come up with ideas, uh, primarily focused around the core product, which is Jira in your case. And you say, okay, let's let's run this through some sort of validation. And if it's a good idea, and if they're able to make the commitment, you say, okay, go ahead and take the uh, twenty percent. Exactly. Is that correct? Okay. And the the twenty percent, how does that work out? Is it like one day a week, two days a week, or, or you know, a couple of, couple of days every couple of weeks? But as, uh, it's entirely flexible. Um, generally, people like to take it in blocks because it's easier when you can focus on a project and spend a couple of days on it. And do they end up working alone on it, or do they like around, run up a crew and say, "Hey, well, I got a you know a couple of other twenty percenters of you." <laughs> Very often people do work on it alone, but nobody can ship something alone because you still need another developer to do testing on it. Okay. Um, but often people do show up with teams of two or three developers as well. Right. Anything else you can t uh, think of to tell us about 20% time? Only that I think it's very valuable because um, the product managers obviously are looking at the bigger picture, but often 20% um, projects just solve little things that are irking people 
and that's valuable too. Right. Do they ever co do folks ever come to you with an idea of something not related to the core project? Yes, so sometimes Jira developers will come and say that they want to work on another product, like make a change to Bamboo or to Confluence, and we also do get developers from those other products wanting to make changes to Jira. Well, thank you very much, Penny. Appreciate you. your time. Take care. Okay, so that were some thoughts around creating autonomy, you know, open workspace, open vacation, fair rewards, merit pay by team, and then uh, creating slack time or innovation time. So I want to segue and start to talk about people operations when, in terms of this concept of mastery. You know, how do we start from where we are? How do we get better and then get really good at what we're doing to, to become masters at what we're doing? So let me ask you um, folks in the audience a quick question over here. Who plays computer games? What, kind of, which, what games do you play? Many games. Any favorites? No favorites. Uh, any other, other computer games? Which one? Temple Run? Okay. You like playing Temple Run? How much do you play Temple Run? There's no end to it. Yeah. The, and uh, so, uh, but you like playing Temple Run? And why do you like playing Temple Run? Yeah. You know, there's a lot of deviations, and as you get better, the challenges increase, right? Other, other games that people are playing. What, what are some? Yes, sir. Lumosity, that's to develop the mind and all that, right? And does that keep you happy? Yeah. So it turns out that game developers are very intelligent. They have, decide, they have discovered this concept of psychological flow. And the way games are designed are, you know, as your abilities get more and more, the challenges get harder and harder, and they keep you in the zone that's called psychological flow. Now, the concept itself was d discovered by a Hungarian-American psychologist. His name is Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. And what uh, Csikszentmihalyi, the name's over there, quite a mouthful, even as bad as Sri Lankan name, I think. Um, so uh, what he discovered is that people who are really engaged in tough things, like tough personal activities, like uh, mountain climbers, or runners, distance runners, or musicians. Any musicians here? Musicians? Any, no musicians? A room full of me? Okay, what kind of mus musician do you play? Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. Right, right. Do you get paid for playing the music? The music? Sometimes, okay. In college, you used to, but not at work, okay. So why do you do it? Uh-huh. So, so what happens is that musicians, runners, and you know, athletes will pursue these hobbies because in of them, they in of themselves gain, you know, allows to gain and have a certain amount of uh, happiness because they allow us to get into the flow. And Chixen Mihai discovered this concept of psychological flow. When we're doing something that's challenging and you're getting better and better, it turns out that the act of doing whatever it is, whether it's playing a particular uh, uh, instrument or playing a particular sport or doing mountain climbing, this, the activity itself, if, these, if that zone is preserved, if you can keep in that flow zone, then the, the activity itself brings ha happiness, right? So this is the psychological flow that we're talking about. So when we design our work, our work environment, as we move towards creating an agile performance management system, we have to understand that if we create these conditions, and you can see on that this slide, the eight conditions of psychological flow, and how closely they map to our, our, our agile work, right? If we have a clear goal to start off with, if we get direct and immediate feedback, if we can have a balance between the skills and challenges, that means as, there are, as our skills improve, the challenges improve commensurately, if we can concentrate deeply on the task at hand, then we'll be able to lose ourselves in the task, lose sense of ourselves, and, create, and the work itself will create happiness, right? So this is called mastery through flow, and this is something that as managers we should be looking at when we design our workspaces, when we create our performance management systems, when we look at our teams, look at the concept of flow and, and look at whether we can design our work to create these conditions of flow because this is how people get better and better. You're probably a really good player of that game by now, right? How many years have you been playing it? No, no, you just say it's okay, thank you. Uh, so the next concept, um, if you're looking tactically, we say, okay, mastery through flow, Longer term, we want to look at mastery through software craftsmanship. Now, there's, 
the um, software craftsmanship is the idea of software craftsmanship has been around for quite a while. A while. Pete McBreen was one of the earlier uh, proponents, and now I think uh, even Jim James Show, who is here at the conference, uh, his book talks about it. Who here has heard about software craftsmanship? Let me see a shot here. So software craftsmanship is this idea that you know we start off as apprentices, as novices in software engineering or software development, and there's a journey that we have to undertake. We have to get training from a master craftsman, craftsmanship, for, excuse me, from a master craftsman. We have to practice, and that's going to allow us to get better, to become to a level of a journeyman, and then on to a master craftsman. So if we can create a system that allows us to go from journey, from apprentice to journeyman to master craftsman, then we can look at master, mastery through software craftsmanship. And then finally, with our people operations, we want to look at purpose. All of us want our job to count for something. Right? We don't want to spend the majority, most of us spend a majority of our work, waking life at work, and how much more wonderful would it be if we could say, well, I come into my work, and my work counts for something, and it creates meaning in my life. Right? So can our organization, can our team, can, our, can, I, can my management create and understand and evolve a shared purpose? Can we discover the shared purpose, and can we align around that shared purpose and if my work can have a shared purpose, and I, if it can help create meaning in my life, then it's going to contribute to work happiness. All right? So if I look at everything that I'm doing, I want to sort of pull it together. Let, I want to create a lightweight process that will take me away from a traditional review and you know, allow me to sit down with my mentor, look at some core areas, skills, activities, and re revisit those every month. I want to look at larger the context of the op people operations and create autonomy, mastery, and purpose through open workspace, software craftsmanship, and such. So I'm going to stop here, and I'm going to turn it over to you guys. We still have some time. Let's take a 10-minute exercise, and let's get the lights on. Can you get the lights on over there? Or is it? And uh, what I'd like you to do, because I saw a number of hands go, uh, go up, what I'd like you to do is to fill out that chart. It's a simple chart. If you like, you can talk to the, if you, you can collaborate with the person next to you if you don't have a chart. Whoops. Um, but um, fill out the chart and l let us know what elements of an agile performance management system you either have or you don't have. So let's go ahead and take a t a 10 minutes to uh, fill that out, and then we'll have a quick debrief. Okay, so um, I'd like to bring it back to the session over here. Let's get a few of you to share your results. Raj, Raj, right? Um, can we get a mic to this table, please? Thank you. So we have three columns over here. The, the leftmost column says, oh, we already do this, so there's nothing new over here. The second column is we can try this this year, and then the last column is, oh, this is like crazy stuff. We're years away. So Raj had a number of things in the second column and in the left column. So can you tell us, sir, about your company and which one, which one of these things you're implementing? So if you could just stand up, introduce yourself, tell us your company and why you're doing what you're doing. Let's give Raj a big hand. So my name is Raj. I'm from uh, Philips. And uh, I'm from the HR team. I, uh, <laughs> Big surprise, that, you know, why I'm here. How many HR guys here in the room? Nobody. Oh, that's a shame. 
Okay, so my role also involves helping the organization transform itself into agile, and that's the reason why I'm here. So coming to the, uh, the questions here. Uh, sorry? I'm the wrong person to answer this. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we, we put him on the okay. spot at the beginning. Yeah. I can be very honest about answering this, right? So, uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, there are things which uh, we are not there, honestly, and there are things which, which is there. Uh, I'll start with the reverse order. So the purpose is something which, uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm from Philips Healthcare. So, you know, we are a healthcare organization, and, you know, the engineers and the people who work for us, they know that, you know, what they're doing is to save people's life, right? And, you know, we do a lot of storytelling around that. So we talk a lot. People know, you know, what they are doing. The field engineers who come back and say that the work they did, how it helped save somebody's life in a remote place in Africa. So, you know, so that element is very, very strong. So, you know, the purpose part is there. Mastery, uh, we can do a lot there, you know. Yeah. Uh, We've got a lot of work to do. So, the, the flow part and, uh, you know, those pieces is something which uh, I guess, you know, the phases, they're, you know, they're, the percentage of people who would be there, but there are a lot of people who are still not there, right? So uh, there's a scope of doing that. 20% uh, of time, uh, uh, you know, we do that. So uh, we, we have a lot of innovation work. The Friday innovation piece happens. Not as structured as possible, uh, but we do a lot of hackathons uh, where a lot of ideas come, and these have been implemented. So some of the best ideas have really come from hackathons, which we do that. Uh, not us defined as, you know, what the lady uh, spoke in the video. Uh, team uh, merit pay, you know, that's something which you want to achieve. So we have a profit sharing, uh, which is at the business level, but I, honestly, I feel that that's not something which people really connect to. So if you really want the team to, uh, you know, look at the, the end result and be motivated. I think there has to be an element where they can connect to and see what value they are bringing and some bit of profit sharing which happens at the team level. Open vacation, uh, no, but we do have, uh, you know, uh, sick leaves, which is uh, honorary basis. So people know that we have cases where we have supported people who have gone for sick leave for two years. It doesn't mean that, you know, people take sick leaves uh, regularly, but there's a sense of security. So I completely agree to, you know, what, what you said. Uh, flexible hours, we have open workplace, uh, we have that. Monthly discussion uh, and feedback, we have that. Uh, personal A3, uh, yeah, not the structure. So final question, are you hiring at Philips? Hiring whom? <laughs> Sounds like a good company to work for. What oh, think? yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so please give We're your a great company to work for, so you know, Can please send your resumes. Can people give their resumes to you? <laughs> yes, please. Okay, please, Raj, you'll get a hiring bonus as well, so let's give Raj a big hand. Thank you. I, I already asked Sanjeev to send his resume to me. So, <laughs> so I'm first in line. Okay. Um, there's somebody, a lady who wanted to share somebody over here. Let's get somebody else. Somebody wanted to, they decided not to share. Who else wants to share their results? Yes, sir. Tell us which company you work for, if you're implementing some of this stuff. Start talking. Hi everyone, my name is Nitin. I work for a company called Dream Orbit. Uh, it's a very small company uh, of 300 people and uh, quite young as well. Like we are in business for the last six years, and we are still learning a lot of things. So a lot of check marks are not there in this sheet. So personal A3, yeah, that's we are still far away because uh, if. I, I don't know how many people are from services industry in uh, IT, and that that makes very difficult to you know really uh, keep a lot of people with in your team for longer time. So to set agenda for anyone for next one year is is really difficult. Uh, so that is something which is which is a real challenge. Uh, monthly discussion and feedback we do have, and uh, that is where we keep discussing what really happened. Uh, that 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 you know that gives a quite quick feedback to developers, to uh, QAs and everybody involved in a project. So that that's one, one form of agile, probably in case of you know, managing the performance, that we, we quickly 
give feedback to the individuals every month. But that doesn't reflect in as, a, as such, you know, uh, a typical performance appraisal where we you know, revise the salary. So you separate the two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And open workspace, I'm not sure uh, how many companies in India can have that because yes. we, have, we have this open cubicle, which we can call as an open workspace anyways, sure. right? Mm -hmm. Means we, we never had those cabins, et cetera, means in any company, right? Uh, you take any company, MP, Wipro, TCS, they all work in the same okay. cubicle so format. I think we're beginning to run short of time. Can you share yeah, sure, one, sure. one more of your Yes. Uh, I wanted to touch upon that 20% uh, uh, sorry, uh, this uh, e-merit pay, uh, which is very, uh, you know, uh, kind of slippery slope. Uh, if you connect that with individual performance, uh, there are companies who have that uh, in past and they are doing away with that and which which we can means we are we have adopted as, as a bonus part of a salary where on the basis of your annual uh, appraisal uh, we give that bonus but we we really don't see that working uh, the way it is represented in this sure. uh, these slides okay yeah sorry right. thank you very sorry much for taking Let's so much time hand. okay so i think we have time for about one or two questions is that correct where's my Couple of questions. We have time for a couple. So, questions. Yes, sir. I thought you guys are already doing all of this at uh, Agile FAQ. Okay. I see. Can we give get the mic to? Uh, to keep talking. They'll put this. This is on. Okay. Cool. Uh, the point is about monthly discussion and feedback. We definitely should have discussion and feedback. My only concern is about the word monthly there. Mm -hmm. Once we put in a regular time-bound activity, there is some chance of it becoming, uh, so, I mean, it, it happens at an unnecessary time or it gets postponed when it was required. Yeah. So it should be as and when needed types is my point. Yeah. Regular feedback. So if you're more agile, you know, monthly is almost too long. You, you could you could do feedback every couple of days or so. Uh, the only reason we say monthly is to f you know, when you're doing feedback just once a year, we at least want to get people used to the idea that they have to do it 12 times a year as opposed to just once a year. But the the, con the concept should be regular feedback, and then we don't have to slavishly follow and say, well, it has to be exactly monthly because the monthly could be um, too long. You know, it, we we want even f more frequent than, than that for sure. Thanks. Okay. Any other question? Yes, sir. Could you repeat the question, please? Executives are very, very smart people. Uh -huh. They've worked out the corporate game and they've won. Uh -huh. How do you get them to buy into challenging the way they work and think differently? Um, there is a certain percentage of executives that I'll call enlightened that will look at this and intuitively align with the system and understand that this is what will deliver value for them. Uh, there's, a, again, a large percentage of executives who are unenlightened, you know, unenlightened if uh, for to put it kindly, and they'll never get it. However, if you look at their corporate performance, you'll see, uh, for, for, you know, the, one of the financial indexes, indexes in the U.S. is the St Standard & Poor's Index. The average tenure of a company 50 years ago used to be about 65 years. That means once a company went on the S&P index, they would be there for 65 years, and it was okay because there wasn't a whole lot of change. Now the average tenure of a company on the uh, S&P index is coming down to 12. That means companies are being created and destroyed almost you know, relatively instantly. So you look at disruption, you're looking at disruption, especially in large companies, at a scale that has been unprecedented in the past. And if there's anything that would, an executive will look for, they may have won yesterday's game, but nobody, ourselves included, has won tomorrow's game. Right? We're all looking at creating a systems that will allow us to be more uh, resilient in the future. So I think if you're an executive and you're looking at this in the future and saying, well, yes, you know, we had awesome performance in, for the last 150 years. You know, Philips you know, uh, or some of these other companies have been around for a, a long time. But it doesn't guarantee. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. And some, some people will get it and some won't. I expect the ones that won't will be you know, writing the companies off in, in the future. So there's no answer to that. I don't think they'll get it.
time. Thank you very much. Uh, there's, if you look in your bag, I think the, the book on the right is in your bag, Lean Jumpstart. I'll be doing a talk on Scaling Agile on, on Thursday. You have contact, my contact information, Raj's contact information. Raj is at the back if you want to talk to him about team profit sharing. I'll be around. Thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah.